Uh, Larry is the National Fire Weather Operations Coordinator for the National Weather Service. This summer will be his 24th season with the National Weather Service and the 17th as the coordinator in Boise. Uh, today, Larry's going to present an update on fire weather initiatives from the National Weather Service. Welcome, Larry. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, in the interest of time, I am going to uh, dive right in here. Um, what I want to talk to you today is about uh, just a uh, thought experiment on the future of red flag warnings. I want to preface this preface this uh, presentation by saying that this is not a roadmap or any indication of official NWS policy of what we're doing. This is just a um, something to get us thinking about what we need to do with red flag warnings and possible changes to the to the program. Uh, a lot of thinking on the drive to work and thinking about uh, things when I'm on a fire and thinking about how we do things. And so this is just meant to get people uh, talking about this. But here's uh, here's kind of how I see the lay of the land and some possible uh, solutions. And again, uh, meant as uh, points of discussion. So. Uh, let's see, red flag warning. We started warning uh, for fire in 1916. The term red flag warning and red flag watch came about in the 50s and 60s when they literally hung red flags off the flagpoles in front of uh, the ranger stations to indicate that uh, there was uh, uh, weather conditions uh, that would prove uh, difficult firefighting in the field. Um, in South Canyon in uh, 94, the uh, investigation from that South Canyon indicated that there was confusion as to whether there was a watch or warning in place. One of the findings or recommendations from that report was that we changed the name of either the watch or the warning so that there would be no confusion, especially as you hear them over the radio. That was when uh, we changed the name of the red flag watch to the fire weather watch. <clears throat> Things to keep in mind about the red flag warning is that the warning the RFW was never meant for the public. It is strictly a product for uh, produced and intended for firefighters and fire managers. Um, due to the fact that these products are available to the public, it is being used by um, TV stations and the public as a fire warning. But uh, keep in mind that this was never meant for the public and the content of it is not meant uh, for public action, shall we say. Um, Currently, the red, uh, the fire weather watch and the red flag warning are based on weather. Uh, we base it on fuel conditions as we get that information from the fire agencies, and it is zone based. The only difference between these two products is the time that they are in effect. A watch is uh, anywhere from 18 to 96 hours out, depending on whether you're talking about uh, uh, synoptic level uh, events like wind and RH, where if you're talking dry lightning, and warnings can be anywhere out to 48 hours or less. We average 13,000 red flag warning issuances per year. Keep in mind that uh, in the 50s and 60s when red flag warning was brought about, they only envisioned that they would be issued at most uh, a handful of times a year. Where is the use of red flag warnings today? Um, Certainly, it's a heads up for critical safety conditions, which was the original intent of the red flag warning. But it's also now being used for resource management and staffing. Uh, it's used for burn and no burn decisions on prescribed burns. Um, again, it's meant for fire managers, but it is being used by the public and it's being used by uh, uh, commercial vendors. Uh, and in conversations with firefighters, uh, we hear a lot. Um, been a red flag warning out for weeks. It's hot, it's dry, it's the West. Uh, it seems to just get lost in the noise. What are some uh, definitions? I'll say right off the bat, and again, uh, if it hadn't been said, I'm also chair of the Fire Weather Subcommittee, so this is uh, stuff that we're taking a look at within the subcommittee for definitions. I'll, I'll say right off the bat that the NWCG uh, definition of red flag warning is, uh, in my opinion, pretty awful. Um, I don't really think it captures what truly a red flag warning is. I actually think the fire weather watch is a better, uh, or at least more on the path to a better um, definition of this product than, than the warning is. So we're going to be looking at changing the red flag warning definition. 
Let's take a look at Fire Weather Watch. A Fire Weather Watch is issued to advise of conditions which could result in extensive wildland fire occurrence. Uh, think dry lightning when you hear that, or extreme fire behavior, which are expected to develop in the next 12 to 48 hours. So let's take a look at extreme fire behavior in the NWCG glossary. Extreme implies a level of fire behavior characteristics that ordinarily precludes methods of direct control action. <clears throat> it involves high rate of spread, prol prolific crowning and or spotting, presence of fire world, strong convection column. So um, let's take a look at other warnings that the Weather Service uh, produces. We uh, produce severe thunderstorm warnings and, and tornado warnings. Those watches are issued by the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, uh, for conditions that may be present. So in other words, the weather conditions are lining up. The warning is only issued by the forecast office, the local forecast office, when there is radar or satellite indication and or reliable reports of the phenomena. And the warnings are based on occurrence and point of impact. Those warnings are issued in a polygon-based warning that uh, only outlines that area that's going to be affected. It's not a zone warning. Um, it is a polygon warning. Um, what are some issues right now? Many firefighters have concerns over overwarning and feeling that red flag warnings get lost in the noise. Red flag warning started out strictly as a safety product and now covers both safety and resource management. The good news about the fire warnings within the National Weather Service is that we have not expanded as needs have expanded. Um, and when I say that, think things like flood. Um, there's all sorts of different flood warnings. There's small stream flooded warnings. There's flood warnings. There's flash flood warnings. There's all different kinds of warnings. We have just kept one warning for fire. The bad news is we've only kept one warning for fire, which means that when an issue came up, when the split came between a safety product and then needing another warning product put out there for resource management, dry lightning overwhelming initial attack, that was rolled into the red flag warning. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that was rolled into the red flag warning instead of uh, doing another product that strictly addressed those uh, resource management issues. Again, commercial vendors are using red flag warning as a proxy, but they have let the Weather Service know that they do not like that product and they wish it was named as something different and they find it difficult to uh, talk or discuss about red flag warnings when they, sometimes there's not even fire on the ground. So um, it, it makes them awkward at times to be uh, relaying that information to the public. They have uh, come out and said they want a firestorm warning. Um, so we got two different, very, uh, very different users out there. We got fire managers and firefighters that are saying uh, there may be a fire, um, and if there is, how will the fire environment dictate my actions? How am I going to achieve my objectives? And then you got the public side that says steps out on the back porch and says, hey, I can see fire and smoke on the hillside. Is this thing going to get to my house? And if it does, when? Do I, do I have, can I get out of here in time? And is this fire going to burn my house down? And in fact, interestingly enough, there was a uh, news story. It was either out of the uh, LA Times or the San Francisco Gate talking about the fires in California. And it talked about a woman who walked out of her home, there's smoke all around, walks out of her home, walks up to a police car, and funny enough, she did not say, hey, what's the uh, latest minimum humidity and wind gusts? What she asked the police officer is, is that fire going to reach my home, and do I have time to evacuate? Is my home going to burn down? That's the thing that we are not addressing with the public, and then both with the Weather Service and the fire agencies, and both our missions include protection of life and property. So that is not something that we can, we as a fire community, uh, rolling the weather service in with the fire agencies, that's not something that we can we can ignore. Um, I'm going to go through these needs individually in the interest of time. I'm going to go through this slide. So let's look at this. What if, what if we could detect fire on the ground in real time? We've never been able to do that before. Um, sometimes we have. If somebody is standing in a spot or you have a uh, spotter up in, or a uh, 
somebody up in a tower on a on a ridge line been able to spot fires but for the most part if you had a fire in a remote area you couldn't find it but things are changing um, we're getting radar data we're getting the new go system going up that uh, is able to spot uh, fires in near real real time so I think the that issue is beginning to uh, change we're getting we're, we're able to possibly start detecting these fires in real time um, what if we could model extreme fire behavior and get meaningful red flag warning criteria from that modeling? Um, so we go back to the definition of red flag warning and extreme fire behavior. Well, we need to know, okay, what what's going to cause extreme fire behavior on any given piece of ground and have that criteria um, set so that when that criteria meshes, when that, when that lines up, the holes in the cheese line up, that we're able to uh, issue these warnings uh, based on uh, good scientific background on, on looking at these numbers. And what if we looked at this from a fire environment view instead of just strictly a fire weather view? So in other words, um, break down the stove pipes, you know, and, and uh, truly give the users, whether it's fire, fire managers and firefighters or the public, the information they're seeking and not handing them a map, handing them some fuels information, and handing them a weather forecast and saying, you make sense of it. So what are our needs? Well, we need a watch product that gives heads up of co that uh, combined weather and fuels conditions could create extreme fire behavior. Well, luckily enough, we already have this product, uh, our current watch, which also we have our current warning. It does the same thing. Uh, predictive services and the fire agencies provide the fuel. Weather service provides the weather. Um, something maybe we could consider. Um, what about SPC issuing the watch? Maybe, maybe not. I think that's something we could certainly look at and see if that makes sense. Um, does the watch probably should be zone-based. Um, maybe polygon, but uh, certainly on a broader scale, uh, if you look at the SPC outlooks for th severe thunderstorm and tornado, they usually cover a pretty, pretty wide swath. Um, we need a warning product that warns on specific places of extreme fire behavior. Notice I said extreme places of fire behavior and took the uh, dry lightning piece out of it. I think the red flag warning needs to go back to a safety product. Uh, it's meant, it was meant and always meant to uh, make the hairs on the back of your head stand up when you hear it. It should give you a higher alert when you're going to be firefighting because you're talking extreme fire behavior. You're not going to be able to go direct on this, and it's going to change your tactics. <clears throat> so we need a uh, product that uh, warns of this extreme fire behavior. I think we still call it red flag warning. Everybody knows what it is, and and um, you know when you say red flag warning, everybody knows what you're talking about. Uh, but changing the idea of red flag warning to there is fire on the ground and it's going to ex display extreme fire behavior. Uh, this product would be uh, uh, out uh, only within the 24 hours. Yeah, if uh, you see a, if a, a fire is detected, then a warning decision is made on that fire immediately, and then uh, a warning is produced, a polygon-based warning is produced if it uh, requires a warning, and that warning is sent out uh, to the firefighters before they even leave the garage. The, uh, the key with this would be the communications of fire occurrence to the weather service in order for them to make a timely decision on warning, and then turning around and getting that warning decision back out to the fire, firefighters and fire managers before they engage with that fire. Um, we need an alert product, because there is uh, lightning is a safety issue when you got folks out in the field, so we need an alert product when there's lightning or thunderstorm outflow frontal wind switches in the area and you got personnel on the ground. So this will allow meteorologists uh, to alert folks that are in the field. Um, we need to know when folks are in the field and where they are and ensure that we get a communications link up so that uh, we can get these um, alerts to them uh, in time. Um, we need a management product that addresses conditions that may overwhelm initial attack, and we need a management product that addresses when conditions are just right or windows of opportunity for prescribed burning. Again, a lot of that is 
kind of rolled into either directly or indirectly into the red current red flag warning. But that's a resource management issue. That's not a safety issue. I mean, you can make an argument that it is a safety issue because you're overwhelming initial attack. But in reality, um, I think you're talking something very different from something that's showing extreme fire behavior and um, and engaging with a fire that's that's displaying the extreme fire behavior. This is more of a re overwhelm, like I said, overwhelming initial attack, a resource management. Uh, I don't know where it goes. Maybe maybe predictive service seven day product. Maybe we come up with a new product uh, jointly. But we need obviously management needs something that addresses these two issues, and we're not providing that right now. And I think we do need to provide that. Uh, we need a public. Pro public product that warns of potential danger due to dry conditions, and we already have that. That's the NFDRS, that's the Smoky Bear sign. I think we just need to do a better job of getting that information out there as a public warning product. Everybody understands it. You know, you see Smoky pointing his shovel to the extreme, then you probably shouldn't light a match out in the uh, in the forest or drop a cigarette butt. And we need a public warning product of danger to the public on ongoing wildfire. Now again, with this public product, nobody's asking, nobody from the public is asking what's the temperature or RH or the wind speed. They want to know that this fire is going to get to their house and burn it down. So I think the way to go about that as a public warning product is that it would be the job of the weather service on the weather side and the fire agencies on the fire behavior and fire modeling side to get information to emergency managers, county emergency managers, whoever's in charge of evacuation and and, and uh, response in that area, to get information to those emergency managers so that they can make a decision. And you have to get it in such a way and in such a time frame that they can make timely and informed decisions on whether an area should evacuate, <clears throat> whether a fire is going to get to a certain area and that, and what the timing of that would be. Uh, so I think we get the information to those emergency managers. They're the ones who write the warning, and maybe the Weather Service disseminates it like we do Amber Alerts, where uh, we don't write the warning, but uh, the emergency managers do with uh, guidance from the Weather Service and consultation from the Weather Service and the fire agencies on where this, uh, where this fire is going to go. Uh, so what's the time frame? Uh, this is certainly not something that's going to get done uh, by next year. There's got to be a lot of pieces in place. Um, namely, you have to have a way to detect these fires in a timely manner. Um, we're actually launching GOES uh, West is going up tomorrow, uh, which should be really interesting to see this summer about uh, what it can do about fire detection. But I think, again, we need to take a look at other uh, remote sensing capabilities, like what, what can we see using radar. Um, we need a spotter network. Severe, fire, severe weather has a tremendous spotter network for uh, detecting storms and tornadoes. We have a built-in one within the fire community, and that's the fire folks out in the field. Uh, we just need to make sure that we get the communication links uh, in place so that we can get word to the weather service of these uh, emerging incidents and get word back to the fire agencies in a timely manner so that they can act upon it before engaging the fire. Um, we do need to engage the emergency management community. We need, uh, in terms of these public warnings, we need to figure out the extreme fire behavior breakpoints so that uh, we can come up with some meaningful um, red flag warning criteria across all of the United States. Um, so there's all sorts of things that need to be in place, but I think these are things that we need to, to take a look at, and I think it gives us a roadmap of where we need to be in, in 10 years. So takeaway is this won't happen overnight, but uh, if we're going to change, then we, we need to start thinking about these things right now. And with that, I will take any questions that you may have. Okay, Karen Riley has a question. Mm -hmm. um, she has some um, I've got some ideas for filling some of those needs. What's your email? Uh, my email is Larry dot Van Bustum. So that's Larry dot Van V A N B as in boy U S S U M as in Mary at NOAA. And that's 
November Oscar Alpha Alpha dot gov. Thanks. Okay, we have another from Gary. Would the smoke dispersion matrix for surface smoke, super fog, potential table, super fog index, or wind profile analysis, smart tools, or products be beneficial to develop, whereby personnel agencies know that critical weather affecting smoke or fire are at critical thresholds? Identifying that critical fire weather condition or in alignment are present. Yeah, I, you know, I certainly think, you know, and then I didn't mention uh, explicitly in this presentation, but I think certainly smoke issues is something we'd have to take a look at and see where it, you know where it gets put in with uh, with this. And there's going to be a smoke management <clears throat> and a uh, management a fire management issue with the smoke, and then there's going to be a public side to it too as well. So absolutely, I think it's something that gets rolled into this. Okay, uh, one more. Why can't the conversation to the new R SW happen in one to two years instead of ten. That's from Mike Mike Haskin. Uh, you know, honestly, I would love to see it happen in one to two years, but uh, maybe call me jaded. But after you know, twenty four years of this, I've come to realize that my previous optimism at two to three years usually gets strung out a little longer. So, um, I, I'm very optimistic about the Go satellite going up. I think we're going to see some fantastic things come from that. Um, already with the testing that they did on the GOES uh, uh, 16, which became GOES East, they're able to detect fires down to 15 acres. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, the timing on that is down to like one, somewhere in the neighborhood of one to five minutes as uh, before it was 15 to 30 minutes. So um, I think we're getting to the point where satellite detection of uh, go satellite detection of emerging, emerging fires probably would detect about 75%, if not more, of the emerging fires uh, across the United States in real time. Um, we're seeing instances in the southeast where uh, folks were detecting fire starts and uh, fires using radar and informing folks that uh, about uh, fires going off, seeing the plume and the radar signatures. And again, we have a huge uh, pool of uh, spotters. So I think, you know, there's that part of it. Um, I don't think the communications link is insurmountable. Uh, the technology is there to do it. We just got to get people's heads wrapped around uh, putting it in place. Um, I think probably one of the heavy lifts is going to be uh, engaging the emergency management community and getting um, getting this mindset of providing them, uh, both the weather service and the fire agencies, providing them the information and having them write the, the, the warning. Um, but again, I don't think that's insurmountable. I think, um, you know, I think, um, it, you know, in this day and age of science and technology, I think it's certainly doable. So uh, I would love to see it happen in less than 10 years, but, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to happen next summer. But we're okay, going to make thanks. strides. Uh, just uh, to wrap that up, we're we're making strides towards that. Um, you know, there's things we're taking a look into, uh, biting biting pieces off as we can do it, and uh, you know, we'll we'll make efforts towards that end goal. Okay, 